Creative Contessa's Kitchen. Today we're going to be making a delicious braised oxtail stew known as coda alla vaccinara. This dish is one of my favorite Italian dishes of all time and it's hardly ever served in American restaurants. So let's go to the kitchen and make it. So let's go through our ingredients to see exactly how we're going to be making this dish, more specifically out of what we're going to be making this dish. Right, so this is of course the crowning piece of the dish, the oxtail, and this is grass-fed, and you can tell that it's grass-fed because the fatty, these beautiful deposits of fat, best part, and I'm sad to see that they cut some of them off. Mm -hmm. Bad butcher. Anyway, they're they're yellow, and that yellow means that this cow ate a lot of grass, if not only grass. In fact, this is supposedly 100% grass-fed, no grain for this cow. And that grass then has imbued this fat with vitamins A and K, which are not to be found in cows that do not get a steady and abundant supply of grass. So. This is our oxtail. Now this is interestingly enough, in historically has been considered the poor part of the meat, the offal as it were. And so this is what the poor people ended up eating. However, um, I thought I didn't really care for beef very much until I discovered oxtail. And then I realized that beef could in fact be flavorful, meltingly delicious, and just absolutely worthy as a foodstuff. So that's our oxtail. Um, our, our sofrito, our saute, our basically the base of our dish, is going to be made from onions, of course, carrots, celery, garlic, I mean, really, not many dishes should lack garlic ever anyway, bay leaves and cloves, which you might think is not typical in Italian cuisine, but actually sweet spices like cloves and cinnamon are a common feature in traditional Italian cuisine. Of course, as a flavor giver, we have here uh, pasture-raised bacon. Pancetta is also used and a uh, smoked pork cheek. I was unable to locate a good source for pasture-raised smoked pork cheek here in Albuquerque. So pasture-raised bacon it is, and as you can see, quite a lot. Then we will also be adding tomatoes. Um, we're actually going to be crushing these by hand because I couldn't find any good quality pre-crushed ones. Mirguen is one of my favorite brands because they really get those tomatoes fr fresh from the farm and they're canned within the same day of being picked. So really high quality tomatoes. Also grown in California and not hauled in from another country. Of course we have our white wine. Some people make coda alla vaccinara with red wine, but I prefer white wine, and a lot of Italians also prefer white wine. And interestingly, towards the end, we're going to be adding actually some cacao powder. Not enough, of course, to make this taste like chocolate, but enough to enhance the flavor, and of course, there'll be some nutritional benefit from that as well. And at the very end as well, we'll be adding some raisins and some pine nuts. Now these sort of ingredients, the cloves and the raisins and the pine nuts, these are actually a holdover from the Middle Ages. So one of the bits of history I found about this claimed that this dish is as old as Rome in itself is. Well, maybe in some form it is, and probably that's true, but the second you start adding tomatoes, it's no longer an ancient Roman dish. That makes it very much like 17th century or later, probably more like 18th century. But the presence of the raisins and the pine nuts definitely at least place this in ancient Roman cuisine at some point and then all up through the Middle Ages. Okay, well let's go ahead and prepare our ingredients. So now that we've done the onions and the garlic, we're working on the carrots. And we want these to be nice and fine because ideally they're going to disappear into the sauce. And the same thing is going to go for the celery. Now I washed these, but I did not peel them because uh, these carrots, at any rate, do not have a particularly thick skin. They don't 
have a need to have a hard, tough, woody outer layer removed. The reality is that if you peel that outer layer off, you're actually removing quite a lot of the vitamin content of your carrot. And also you're just removing part of your carrot. So it's going to cook down and basically turn into a nice paste. There's no reason to remove that. So same thing goes for our celery. We're going to chop it up nice and fine. Now with the celery, we're actually going to reserve half of it for later because there's actually a two stage process to a good coda alla vaccinara. And the two stages involve the sofrito stage, which is done at the very outset of the cooking process. And then at the end of cooking, we take the remaining celery and we're going to saute that in our, some more olive oil, along with our pine nuts and our raisins. And then we'll add that at the very end of cooking so that the celery still has some texture and still has a little bit of crunch left in it. So I'm going to grab a bowl into which to put this combo. Now you will find there are many different recipes for coda la vaccinara and all of them, many of them coming from different Roman cooks, in fact. So the basic tenet is a sofrito, oxtail, some bacon, you know, that's, those are the basics, the specifics of what kind of, you know, what kind of preserved or smoked pork, cured pork is actually the word I'm looking for, or what kind of wine, whether you add pine nuts and raisins and cacao powder or not, those are the items that seem to vary, but the bases, so Frito, tomatoes, wine, oxtail, go. Right, okay need to chop up our bacon. Now these are bacon ends as they are called and just like it sounds these are the ends of the pork belly after they sort of finished cutting up the pork belly, the cured pork belly, and for whatever reason it was decided that these pieces didn't fit into a package or they weren't the right size, they, they weren't the right slice width. And so they're all kind of dumped into a package and they're sold at a significantly cheaper price than bacon is, but it is just bacon. So I managed to get this lovely pasture-raised bacon from my co-op for only $3.99 a pound instead of the $12.99 a pound it would normally be because I accept that it's not the pretty bits. But I don't need it to be pretty if I'm using it in a stew. In fact, it's, its aesthetic value is zero because it too shall be vanishing into the stew. So for a sofrito, you want all the ingredients to be chopped pretty finely because the idea is that you want your stew to be thick but not uh, chunky. You don't want individual components sticking out. That's not the point. The sofrito, um, which literally means under fried, I think, um, is the flavor base, the flavor foundation of your dish. It should never be obvious in its texture. It should be obvious in its flavor. So, well, and that's what happens when you have dull knives. Our knives are so terribly dull after multiple moves to and fro across the ocean, back across the ocean again, back across the ocean again, back across the ocean yet again. And then I think a third, a fifth or sixth time thereafter. The problem with dull knives is that they jump and they skip and you have to apply more force than you should and then the force gets misapplied. So I just cut my fingernail off. Oh well, that fingernail had already been sacrificed to the gr box grater, so it was probably doomed in any case. Okay, so now we're going to crush our tomatoes. I'm going to put this back in its bacon dish first though. Pro tip, never use the even dull edge of your knife um, to scrape items into off of the cutting board and into another container because that will dull it. And, and the back is not really ideally suited for it either. I mean, yes, you can use the back, but 
instead, you could actually just use a tool that's made for that. It's called a bench scraper. And it's perfectly flat all the way across, and it allows me to manipulate my ingredients very precisely without waving the sharp edge of a blade around in the air. So as I said, I was unable to locate a good brand of organic crushed tomatoes. So my solution therefore is to crush these myself. And it's a little cathartic actually. Give your hands a bit of a spa day. You'll also <clears throat> discover quickly if you have any cuts of which you were unaware. So what I'm going to do and this little juicy, so I'm going to grab another bowl for this. I'm going to manually crush these. So I do so by inserting my fingers into them. Crush, crush, crushing. Now, yes, you could put this in a blender maybe, but um, that might actually create just a puree and we don't want a puree, we want crushed tomatoes. So we do want there to be some life, some body left in these. Just to make sure I get all of that tomato juice out of there, I'm actually going to pour the wine into there that I will be needing for this dish. And make sure no tomato is left behind. Possibly more than we need, but that's okay. Okay, time to move on to cooking. Oh, wait, no, I lied. So one more key ingredient we need to prepare, and that is the parsley. And I forgot to mention this when we were going through our little ingredient tour. It was sitting there in conspicuously in its little basket. So this is for my own garden. And I've discovered, amusingly, that parsley loves the winter in the desert here in Albuquerque. It not only did it not die, it's been thriving all winter. I haven't done anything to it. I haven't even watered it. Um, it is enjoying its life in the corner of my yard. Right, okay, time to get to cooking. So we're here at the cooking stage. I have my Dutch oven right here on the pan, on the pan, no, on the stove. Um, <clears throat> of course, I, like any civilized cook, cook over flame. Some of you may have electric stoves um, that might actually take longer to heat up than the flame, depending on the kind of electric stove. Poured enough olive oil in to completely coat the pan and it wants to be a nice, you know, respectably thick coat. And I'm now heating it up over medium low heat. We do not want this to come too hot. For one, especially virgin olive oil does not respond well to heat. Uh, it actually denatures it, denatures the monosaturated fats and can, can make it um, not particularly good for you. Although monosaturated fats are, excuse me, monounsaturated fats are much more heat stable than polyunsaturated fats but even still after a certain heat they will not respond happily so we actually want this temperature to be medium low we want these vegetables to soften we don't want them to brown or blacken so once i feel that that has reached the right temperature we shall add our aromatics and that's going to be more, more or less all of the ingredients, um, 
90% of the ingredients in this recipe will be going in at this stage. And we're gonna be building our flavor base. And then once the aromatics have blended and created their delightful medley, we shall then be adding the oxtail and we'll let the oxtail absorb the flavors from that sofrito at which point we will then add our white wine. So this is actually a common technique in Italian cuisine, um, in many parts of Italy, in fact, where you create an aromatic sofrito, that wonderful rich flavor base, and you add a meat, let the meat absorb the flavors that have built up, and then add your liquids to create the sauce. So just keep that in mind if you're looking to, uh, you know, sort of maybe modify any of your own recipes to make them more authentic or enhance their flavor profile. So I feel that this is warm enough. So here we go. Remember, we always want to minimize our waste. Make sure you get every last bit. And this looks at this moment as though it's quite a lot, I know. <clears throat> looks, you know, how on earth are we going to fit everything in there? But as this starts to cook down, and it will cook down, a lot of the water contained in all of these vegetables is going to evaporate and it's going to compress significantly. We're going to go ahead and add our bay leaves and our cloves. And the Mediterranean bay leaves are a weed. It's, it's a bush, it's a laurel tree, it looks more like a shrub by our standards, but by Mediterranean standards, it's a tree. And they grow, they're very ubiquitous. They grow basically everywhere. And my friends who live in the Mediterranean, for example, Spain, when they need bay leaves, they simply go outside. Literally, they exit their apartment building, go to the row of bay, of laurel bushes, and just harvest some fresh bay leaves. If I ever live someplace long enough, <laughs> I plan on planting bay leaves as long as it's a Mediterranean climate because I want to be able to just go outside and pick bay leaves, pluck them fresh from the bush. The flavor of fresh bay leaves is, is non pare. It's really, it's, there's nothing like it. The dried can't even come close. So I'm just going to mix this all together. And once it's mixed, I'm going to just let it be. <laughs> and the uh, thing I'm doing right now is just ensuring that we don't have any large clumps of bacon. You know, we don't want any bacon uprisings in our dish. They should be evenly distributed amongst the other ingredients to create a perfectly utopian, heterogeneous mixture. So we're going to just let this cook now, and we will stir it occasionally. So, go to. Okay, well you can see how much that has cooked down. So we are now at the next phase, which is adding our oxtail. So my Dutch oven isn't as big as some Dutch ovens are, so we sort of have to manipulate this space. If you have a nice large Dutch oven, good for you. I am going to recommend using, and we're gonna turn this up to medium high actually, I'm going to recommend using tongs so that if there's any charming little splatters that happen, they don't burn you. Or me, in this case specifically, I will admit I'm more concerned with me at this moment. So what I'm going to do to create space here, 
is just push this over this side to then make room. Because we really, we absolutely positively want these oxtail to be flush on the bottom of your Dutch oven because we want them to brown. And they're not going to brown if they're sitting on top of a bed of sofrito. The sofrito will brown and then possibly burn and meanwhile your oxtail hasn't browned at all. So now that the oxtail is in there, we're just going to let that cook until it browns. Um, and then we will be flipping it so that it browns on the other side as well. So remember that browning action is really key to building flavor because that caramelizes, uh, that actually helps convert some of those proteins into sugars as far as I understand. It also caramelizes any of the sugars that happen to be naturally occurring in the meat and that builds beautiful, beautiful flavor. Okay, let the browning commence. Okay, so we're just going to give our tail a check. Oh, yep. That is browning quite nicely, so I'm going to go ahead and flip these. That one's not as nicely browned. Maybe the others might not be ready. It's not quite ready yet. Just keep doing its thing. That one is. It does not want to pick. Okay, well, I'm just going to let these down a little bit more. But you can already see how this sofrito is just breaking down, slowly melting into itself. It's going to be so delicious. It smells absolutely decadent. Mm. Okay, more brownie. Brown, brown, brown. Okay, so despite battery issues with our camera, we're now giving all of the meat a turn. Now, if you are starting to get some sticking um, on the sides of your Dutch oven, the way I was, as long as it's not burnt burnt, it's just really dark brown, that's still salvageable. can do is go ahead and add a little bit of wine to deglaze that and stir it so that it scrapes the bits up off of the pan and they don't turn from lovely caramelized brown into charcoal black. There is this magic burn yourself either. There is this magic tipping point at which the crown bits go from being delicious to awful and carbonized. In my case, my pan Dutch oven is a little small, so I have to move some things out of the way in order to adequately scrape. Make sure you scrape the bottom of the pan as well. So all of those delightful sugars that have formed from the 
application of heat to those veggies also get loosened and do not turn into charcoal. As you're doing this, do also make sure that you don't get your hand too low into the Dutch oven because that steam coming off, the closer you get to the source of the steam, the hotter it gets and it will give you third degree burns. Never underestimate the power of steam. Now that I've flipped these, I'm going to let them, give them a chance to brown on this other side. And then we're going to add more wine. And we're going to let that wine cook down. Okay, brown, brown, brown. We're going to go ahead and add the rest of our wine now. And you'll want to go ahead and give it another scrape. Just make sure that for this purpose I'm going to use my wooden spatula. And make sure all those nice bits get loosened up. And then we are going to cook this down until that wine disappears. ground pepper and there we go cover and stew I said it will take at least two hours possibly more likely for <laughs> um, check it at about two and see what's happening low heat let it do its thing So it's been um, actually many more than four hours because shh, I got so sleepy last night that I couldn't wait for it to finish. So I finished cooking it this morning. However, I do think even still the combined cooking time was probably somewhere on the order of mm, six hours. And that's okay. So let's see what we've got. Here's how your finished stew should look. Let's see, you can see in how the meat has already fallen off of the bone in places and with very little prodding, the rest of that will come off. We have a nice thick ragu. Okay, so now we're at the finishing stages. So that is going to involve a little bit of sauteing. So I'm going to take a medium sized skillet, add just enough olive oil to coat heat that up over medium heat 
And then we're going to add our pine nuts first, but first bring, let your pan come up to temperature. So we'll be adding the pine nuts first and we're gonna let those toast lightly. So they'll turn a, a slightly darker shade of golden than they are now. And then we will add in our raisins and our celery that we reserved from the initial cutting and a little bit of cacao powder. So this is all going to uh, add a sort of sweet and savory and nutty combination of flavors. And the cacao powder, again, it's not going to make it taste like chocolate. It's just going to serve to enhance the flavor because cacao powder has compounds that chemically just enhance whatever other flavors happen to be there. Also, of course, cacao powder, especially if it's the raw kind, has uh, all sorts of nutrients, micronutrients, and macronutrients that are just extremely nutritious. Okay, so that's looking warm enough to toast. When you're, when you're toasting nuts, you don't actually necessarily have to wait for it to come up to temperature, uh, because actually sometimes the gentle heating will allow your nuts to toast more evenly. And technically pine nuts aren't nuts, they're seeds. There is a botanical distinction there. And if I had been a really responsible Contessa, I would have looked up that distinction to share that with you, maybe for a future video. So if, well, this is waiting to toast. If uh, your oxtail meat has started falling off of the bone, but the stew itself is not thick enough, then what I do, and what I in fact did, is remove the chunks of oxtail, put them in a bowl, and then let the ragu continue to cook down because what you don't really want to happen is for the oxtail meat to completely disintegrate into uh, shredded beef. Okay, I mean, maybe you might want that, and if you want that, then by all means, just let it cook until it all disappears. I personally prefer th for there to still be some chunks of meat in my coda la vaccinada. So the thing about toasting pine nuts is that you need to keep your eye on it because it will go from one, and this is actually true of nuts anywhere. Yeah, so that annoying sound is my completely useless smoke and fire alarm and I'm going to have my husband open the back door to vent air. See, what we've discovered is that even if our house is completely filled with actual smoke from an actual fire, um, our smoke detector, our fire alarms will not go off. But if I'm cooking anything in the oven at a high temperature, it will go off. So yay for modern technology. I apologize for that. As I was saying, and as you can see is happening, you need to keep your eye on nuts, any kind of nut, whether it's a pine nut or almonds, because they will toast very quickly and you will end up with burnt nuts. And there is very little that is less appealing than the rancid taste of a burnt nut. And if you see that some are toasting more quickly than others, then your best bet is to add the next stage of ingredients because you it's just annoying to have to pick out the ones that are actually already cooked. So in my opinion, these are toasted enough. I'm going to go ahead and add my celery, my raisins, cacao powder. And we're going to saute this until the celery sort of starts to soften. Wow, the smell of that cacao powder is, is quite nice. Our celery is now soft-ish. It's not very soft, just a little less crunchy than it was. So I'm going to move my stew back onto that burner and turn it on medium low. And I'm just going to scrape this all straight into the pan. Stir that 
in. And we're gonna let that stew together for about 10 minutes so that the flavors can meld. So it has now been 10 minutes. I'm just going to now adjust for salt. Take a small taste. Add some pepper. Nope, not without peppercorns in it. it up. So here is an interesting tidbit. The traditional, traditional way of eating this stew, and this certainly dates back to the ancient Roman times, is to eat it using just bread. Straight out of a bowl with bread. No spoon, no implements. The bread becomes both your utensil and the accompaniment with it. More modernly, uh, there are dishes whereby this is served over pasta. So if you're going to do bread, leave it the meat in large chunks. If you plan to serve this over pasta, then uh, either stir so that they fall apart, or if they're not quite falling apart, that's easily pull them out of the pot and chop them so that they blend in more easily with the pasta. Okay, time to plate this up. We have reached the final stage. The food is plated up, and now all I have to do is add the final piece de résistance, which is not necessarily traditionally called for, but in my household it is. Some freshly grated Pecorino Romano. There might be some traditionalists out there screaming in outrage, but I don't care. Nice. I like Pecorino Romano because it's a sheep's based cheese, so it adds a very interesting flavor profile to most tomato based dishes. Well, any tomato based dish, really. So, this has been Cooking with the Contessa. Uh, Coda la vaccinara. Nope. That is not how that's pronounced. Coda la vaccinara. Sorry, we live in a world of pandemic and vaccinations are high on the list. Um, the root of those words is actually the same, but yeah. So, coda alla vaccinara. Enjoy. P.S. So the meal is done, but if you look on the plate here in front of me, you will see that we have some very valuable leftovers. So these bones, do not throw these bones out. These bones still have tons of delicious connective tissue and marrow within their recesses and decorating their ends. So you should definitely save these in your fridge in a container. And once you've finished all of your coda la vaccinara, you should take these and use them to make bone broth. Little bit of 
veggie clippings, which I also kept actually from our process. I kept carrots, I kept the bits of onion, I kept the snippets of celery, and I will take those, add them to a pot with the bone remnants, pour some water and some red wine, and make a delicious rich broth from it. So, part of sustainable cooking with the Contessa. So thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's video and you'd like to see more such content, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you would care to actually be a patron of my endeavors, then please do subscribe to me on my Patreon page. Happy cooking, stay creative. That could be fun. End of uh, end of the film. End of film video. Don't you think? <laughs>